A really valuable skill to have as an investor or a trader is the ability to listen to somebody that has a strong opinion about a market or a trend or an idea and listen to them without bias. And today I hope you can do just that because I have two Bitcoin maximalists on today that have very strong opinions about the future of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. We go deep into some things like common scams, um, price predictions for the future, what we think about regulators and regulations on financial markets. And I hope you can, again, just soak this in and no matter if you agree with what they have to say or you disagree with mostly everything, I think you can get value out of this conversation. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. All right, guys, welcome back. We've got a round two with the toxic Bitcoin maxis. Brad Mills and American Hoddle. What's up, guys? What's up, buddy? Good to see you again, man. It's been a minute. I was just looking at when we did our last little video here on my channel. That was back here in May of 2022. So kind of midway through the shitstorm that was the deep bear market. I think it was. Yeah, it was you right can measure after it in the thickness of my beard, actually. Oh yeah, you're right, dude. You've got only like an inch on that beard. Now you're full, full on mountain man. <laughs> Actually, dude, this is just May 2023. So I'm, I wait wearing, to start going. I'm wearing sunglasses in that shot. And I, I literally lost these fuckers for a year. And I found them yesterday. So it's like a it's like a weird sign. They were in yes. the couch the whole time. We, we couldn't do another interview until you found those glasses. There so now, now, now that they're I'm back. Ready. Right there now. we go, man. Yeah. So I think last time we talked, it was like right after the U S T implosion, yep. it was kind of way before, um, FTX imploded, but we were given a lot of warnings and just talking about the reality of like, you know, crypto and scams and future Bitcoin. So, so much has happened since then. I wanted to have y'all back on the channel and just talk about all the crazy stuff that's happening right now. It's like the, the, the insanity has been dialed up to 11 and this week the big news was the Binance DOJ criminal case and fine Kraken's also getting uh, sued round two from the SEC this time it looks like they're going to go for even more than 30 million bucks what what are you guys focused on right now what do you see as some of the biggest threats or opportunities and let's just jump into it yeah I'll go first man I mean Thinking back to, you know, a year ago, Chris, uh, when we last spoke around that time, I mean, the fear was, you know, all markets run on fear and greed, right? Those are the dominant emotions. But the fear in crypto is the fear and greed is so out of whack. I mean, it's at extremis at both ends. I mean, people are basically bipolar uh, in this space. And the fear was out of control a year ago uh, when we were talking. And I was basically fielding phone calls from all sorts of friends who are, you know, long-term OG Bitcoin hodlers, guys who've been around a long time, seasoned vets who were frankly scared as fuck. Right? And, uh, you know, we, we call each other in these moments to kind of talk ourselves down off the ledge. And I think we all came to the conclusion that like, you know, a lot of this stuff is temporary. There's nothing wrong with Bitcoin at a protocol level. Nothing has fundamentally changed about the thesis here. Nothing has changed about the Bitcoin story. And we expect, we Bitcoin maximalists, uh, you know, at large expected Binance, we expected FTX, we expected Luna, we expected BlockFi. We expected a lot of these things to go down. Famously on Twitter, I myself had a bet with the CEO of BlockFi shorting the company into the ground at a time when the company was valued at two bill. I, so I won that Ooh. bet. I told him the company was going to go out of business. He, he told me, obviously, it wasn't. He was talking to his book. Uh, I won, right? I still have yet to collect. So Zach, you know, Zach Prince, uh, former CEO of BlockFi. I'm I'm looking for the coin, my guy. You owe it to me. Anyway, <laughs> what did you bet him? So yeah, we bet one coin that BlockFi would not be in business in. Uh, it, I, the bet was a really long duration, but it was 37 years. So he oh, was wow. saying in 37 years, BlockFi will still be operating. And I was like, that's free money. I'll take that bet. But yeah, two years later, BlockFi was basically bankrupt and and out of business. Right. So it only took two years to collect on that bet. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, fast forward to today. The market sentiment has shifted almost entirely to people are bullish now. Everybody's anticipating a big bull run coming. Like once we get through the Bitcoin halving, uh, once the Bitcoin ETF is approved, actions like 
Binance, you know, while seen from the outside as being negative for Bitcoin, from the inside are very, you know, seem to be very positive because we view them as sort of like a purging activity. And we also, the DOJ and the Treasury have been telegraphing their actions for some time. And we knew something was coming against Binance and it finally happened. I think maybe the, the next big catalyst or the last big domino to fall before we can finally get this Bitcoin bull run underway is the Mt. Gox coins being released to creditors, uh, many of which have already fallen into the hands of hedge funds, et cetera. So I think it's kind of a non like as a market factor, it's a non story. But psychologically, there's still an overhang there of people expecting those coins to hit market and sell off pretty hard. Yeah. Brad, I wanted to bring this up. <laughs> this was your tweet, I think, yesterday. <laughs> yeah. It says, wow, at the CZ News, if you had told me in 2020 that FTX, Terra Luna, Gemini, Celsius, 3AC, Binance were all Ponzi's run by fraudsters, I'd have told you that you forgot about DeFi, NFTs, SPACs, meme coins, meme stocks, U.S. Treasury, GSIB banks, real estate, and blue chip tech stocks. <laughs> <laughs> That was oh, a, yeah. that was a, so, so I saw some guy post the first half of that meme and then he said, uh, I would have totally believed you. That was his line, right? He was like, mm -hmm. if you had told me and then you listed a bunch of crypto companies, we're all frauds run Ponzi's run by fraudsters. I would have totally believed you. But then, you know, I went and I looked at that guy's Twitter and he doesn't like Bitcoin either. So I said, I'm going to have to make this a little better. So I tried to level up his meme and include all the traditional stuff that was also sort of Ponzi-esque and exploded in spectacular fashion over the last two years. So except for Bitcoin. Yeah. It, it's funny, you know, people forget like uh, a lot of my friends and family that aren't in the Bitcoin space, they're like, man, how is it? Like I've, I heard like crypto and Bitcoin are dead and or, are you doing okay? I'm like guys, Bitcoin's up over a hundred percent this year. It's up 120%. So, uh, it, it, you know, a lot of people just don't pay attention, but yeah, I mean, I, I think all of these things that you listed are kind of a good example of why market sentiment is still so shit and people are mm -hmm. still so, you know, negative on crypto, crypto in quotes. And yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely a scarlet letter now. And um, what do you guys think is, I guess, the outlook for, you know, we can talk about Bitcoin, but crypto specifically over the next couple of mm. years like do you guys think binance and all the other big exchanges are going to implode are they going to survive and something else is going to happen what what do mm. you guys think if we if we do a video in a year what are some predictions that you want to make Brad you go first cuz i think me and you have a slight disagreement here a and i think bit, your but... your take is more robust than mine so chris i don't know if you want to um i sent us in in our uh, private you know, group chat there on Twitter. I sent yep. a few posts. There's one there that the very top one is kind of from the earlier this year when the meme coins like Pepe and all that stuff started pumping and mm -hmm. everybody's like, it's a bull market. We're back. And then uh, if you want to bring up that chart, I can like kind of walk you through the perspective. Yeah. Like zoom in on that chart. Just click on the picture. Yep. Um, this is the operating sort of thesis I've had for a long time. And it was actually a, co a conversation on Clubhouse with Hoddle where I came to this conclusion because, you know, Hoddle was saying, you know, that the, the Bitcoin could have a good year in 2023. And I was like, no way, man. Don't like if this is a perfect cycle, like repeating of the last cycle. I felt so shit in 2019. You know, if, tw if, if we're going on the four year cycle and we're looking at everything repeating, then you would look at, 2023 is like the 2019 cycle and for any of your listeners probably a lot of them were in the markets in 2017 and then mm -hmm. suffered through the brutal bear market and the brutal routing of what happened in the altcoin space in 2018 and 2019 they would recognize that chart um so you know hodl was like i don't know what you're talking about man i was just holding bitcoin back then like i had a great year in 2019 and it made me double take and go back and look because i was like a little bit over indexed to you know, diversification back in 2018, 2019, I didn't have the strong conviction of just like, if you were convicted on something, you should just concentrate, which is another thing that HODL kind of uh, helped me come to, you know, with, with discussions on clubhouse about investors like Ray Dalio and, and all these different, uh, you know, Warren Buffett and people like that, that 
well, Jeff Bezos, right? Like he didn't diversify into a bunch of other company stocks. He concentrated on himself and his one asset that he thought was going to do the best, which was his Amazon stock. And he concentrated and he beat the market and he beat all odds. So, you know, common tropes in cryptocurrency circles and in trading is like diversification. You got to like take your profits and use the house as money and all these different sort of things. So people can easily get into the mindset of like, well, I, I can't just be Bitcoin only. I can't just hold my net worth in Bitcoin. I got to be exposed to crypto. What if there's like, you know, other networks that have network effects and other coins that do well? I got to have those too. So it was kind of coming through this 2018, 2019 cycle of realizing that there's no such thing as diversification in crypto, really. There's just the Bitcoin cycle, and then you can get leverage on Bitcoin by trying to allocate to the right altcoins. And it's the mm -hmm. same as like, you know, leverage trading on an exchange, Bitcoin. Um, because if Bitcoin's doing good, the altcoins will do okay too. And sometimes they'll do amazing in bubbles. But if Bitcoin's doing bad, look out below for altcoins. They're going to get you absolutely wrecked. And so to, to circle that all back around, if you want to bring that chart up, um, the 2019 cycle for shitcoins was really bad at the end of the year. There was no capitulation, really. The 2018 was pretty bad. It was a brutal year, down 80%. It was this time it's different. You know, we all had this thing of like the herd is coming. The ICOs are here. They're going to disrupt venture capital. They're going to disrupt the regulators. All through 2018, once Bitcoin topped at like basically the beginning, January 2018, altcoins still did well for a while. Like it, there was a parabolic blow off top in Ethereum and shitcoins and ICOs for a month or two after Bitcoin topped. So 2018 was like really a big bear market for everything. And then you get to 2019 where, you know, we hit lows of bitcoin but then bitcoin had a crazy year that's why i have this arrow here you are here this chart is a 2018 2019 cycle and i'm assuming here that we're repeating right and this is january of this year and so far it's played out exactly like this mm -hmm. for the 2021 2022 and now 2023 and i think it's going to continue into 2024 so you are here well now we're like you know middle of this chart if you were to update it, it we're in probably um september or something like that where there's like a, a big peak but it's kind of declined in the altcoin stuff so we had in 2019 a major pump in shit coins because the the regulators came in and they started shutting down ether delta and shutting down all these icos and the big exchanges started facing scrutiny over listing securities and same sort of narrative repeating and while that was happening Bitcoin actually had like 100% gain in 2019 and it actually went up like 300% at one point and kind of came back down, but ended the year about 100% up, which would be like yeah. where we are right now. It would be about 100% up in 2023. Yep. So the altcoins, though, on the other hand, at the end of 2019 had their final capitulation. So in Q4 2019, which is very equivalent in the cycle to Q4 2023 or Q1 2024, you know, give and take a quarter, I'm still expecting major capitulation in the altcoins. And I've been expecting the altcoins to pump for all year. Like I've just like Bitcoin, they're going to follow Bitcoin in the cycle. They're going to try to follow Bitcoin. But fundamentally, Bitcoin is a different asset and doesn't have all the risks that altcoins have. And people have been drinking the Kool-Aid on, on crypto narratives, even still. And they've been like going all in on Solana and all these coins because they, they, th they think that the capitulation happened already and that we're back in a bull market and they start, should start accumulating altcoins because they want alt season to happen again. And sure, maybe if you got lucky and you allocated, you, maybe you're up. But I'm really expecting altcoins to capitulate. I don't think we had the final capitulation yet. And just because this news of this week with Binance and everything it just makes me even more convicted in that theory that we have yet to see final capitulation in altcoins. I think, you know, Hoddle and I basically were both calling the bottom at like between 16 to 20 K Bitcoin around the same time. Um, and I still believe that like Bitcoin is separating from, from the crypto coins. And I, I mean, I'm just like pretty convicted that Ethereum is just going to keep trending down and all coins are going to keep trending down in Bitcoin terms and Bitcoin is going to catch its stride and really decouple from crypto and separate itself from like uh, the rest of the markets. I, 
I think that's an important point to hammer home is like when we say in Bitcoin terms, what we mean is you look at the price of Ethereum and you see where it's trading against Bitcoin, right? You do not look at it against United States dollars. If you look at it against United States dollars for any of these shitcoins, you can get pretty fooled because, you know, sometimes they look like they're doing pretty well, right? If you look at them in terms of how much Bitcoin you're able to, to buy, uh, they go down and down over time. So Ethereum has never reached its 2016 peak. And occasionally when it reaches like a mid-cycle run, it'll trend up a bit. Uh, and then it just bleeds over time. It bleeds back down. And so we as Bitcoin maximalists, right, or, or people who believe in Bitcoin, um, you know, Bitcoin is king. Liquidity begets liquidity. Bitcoin is not going to be dethroned anytime soon. Bitcoin is the number one cryptocurrency and has never been removed from that spot. And I will go out on a limb and say, you know, it likely never will be. Right. And so you want to get at the end of this game, you know, you want to get as many Bitcoins as you possibly can. So if you're trading for dollars, you might as well just go do penny stocks or do biopharma or do whatever, right? Go do SPACs, go do memes, meme stocks, do do GMC, whatever, right? Like AMC, uh, GM, wait, what's the other one? GameStop. <laughs> GME, you know? AMC. GME, yeah. GME yeah. AMC. Coins. Yeah, you can see how 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 little of a DJ I actually or meme am. meme stocks. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it's like, yeah, there are a million things you can trade for dollars. But if you're here in Bitcoin land, crypto world, whatever, you should be trading in order to make more Bitcoin. Now, personally, as an investor, long-term investor, hodler, I don't, I don't think you should do that at all in the first place, right? So like, but if you want to trade in order to make more Bitcoin, that's the game. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I mean, that's been my message forever is if you're gonna yeah. get in altcoins, do it in a short-term basis to accumulate more fiat and more Satoshis. But yeah, your average person thinks that they can just like, use the shotgun approach, buy a ton of shit coins and that maybe one of them or a dozen of them are going to outperform Bitcoin. I think the odds of that are like almost zero. And yeah. over time, I mean, we know, yeah, on the alt BTC charts, like these things always bleed out compared to Bitcoin on a long, yep. long enough time. What's um, that horizon. you got up on the chart there? This uh, is ETH BTC. ETH BTC, okay. Yeah. yeah. And so in the classes that we do in the wealth building community, I talk a lot about, you know, like how in the alt season, you see ETH can gain a little bit on Bitcoin. What in time frame is this? Sorry, I can't see the markers. Uh, this is daily. This is going back to 2019. Okay, so, like so it's like a longer the... sort of structure of ETH BTC. Well, you're yeah. seeing, what you're seeing, Brad, is the mid-cycle trend up that ETH did. But you can see if, you know, Chris zooms back out on the chart, you can see that it never recaptures it's 2017 high in Bitcoin. Oh, gotcha. Trend. There we yeah. are. Okay. So you see the clear the clear line down from 17. Yeah. Yeah. And and basically over the past couple of years, like in 2021, we saw ETH actually gain on Bitcoin during the, the bubble. But then when the bear market hit, they were actually kind of tracking together, like Bitcoin and ETH were falling together. But most recently this year, I mean, ETH has been bleeding out to Bitcoin because Bitcoin's gains have been, you know, Bitcoin's been collecting all the capital flow, at least so far. And we're actually, we're kind of back at a key support zone where if we're going to go back into an alt season, this is where I'd expect it to happen. But I wanted to ask you guys your opinion on yeah. like the Binance thing and maybe what the future of liquidity for alts look like. But, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of mirror your point and agree and say like, yeah, like Bitcoin is in a class of its own. And it's, I think people do make the mistake of like just trading Satoshis for shit coins over a long period of time. You're only going to lose by doing that. And the only way I think it makes sense to play in the alt space is if you're disciplined and skilled and you can trade with the goal of building your long term Bitcoin stack or accumulating more fiat that you can reinvest. But most people do that the wrong way. You know, the the reality is 90 or 95 percent of people are going to lose all their money to a small percentage of professionals that know how to do it the right way. Yeah. Or by, insiders, by the way, let's, let's, you know, that have yeah, the pre mind be, to just dump at any cost. Let's be real here, too. I mean, how many of the people that are crypto traders are the person that Chris just outlined? Like, basically zero. Like, maybe, yeah. maybe there's 0.01 percent of the population is a disciplined trader you know a lot of crypto traders have this one neat trick they do chris where they don't pay taxes <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah the gains look great when you're risking jail time you know what I mean? it's like Oof, when yeah. every time you go something that traders should know by the way when we're talking alts and btc is every time you go token to token 
if you have a gain, that's a taxable event. And if it's mm-hmm. short term, it's a higher taxable event, you know, capital gains wise than it is long term, right? So if you're doing a lot of token to token stuff and you're winning, you might actually at the end of the year end up having a tax bill that's larger than your profit. And that happens to yeah. crypto traders all the time. They get totally fucking wrecked that way. Yeah, pe- people will sell, you know, in a bubble and make a bunch of fiat and yeah. then the price of their existing or their remaining crypto will fall and then yeah, you could actually lose money if you mismanage your bankroll. I hear this I hear this stupid shit all the time. People say things like, you know, well, oh no, bro, I went to a stable coin, so that's not taxable, dude. It's like, yes it is, my <laughs> guy. It's taxable. Well, I went yeah. from ETH, I went from ETH to Bitcoin, so that's not taxable because I never touched dollars. No, that's that's taxable too, bud. Like you might want to learn <laughs> the ins and outs of what you're doing here, you know? Yeah. Mo- most people have no idea, but we, we actually cover a lot of like advanced tax strategies in the community because yeah, I mean, most people, especially in the U S are just blind to it. Totally. But, well, it's a very real factor when it comes to your actual trading profits, right? Absolutely. Like, yeah. Yeah. You have to take into account your taxes for, you know, if you're actually profitable, cause you can go bing, bang, bing, bang, you know, back and forth between assets. But if you're creating taxable events every time you do that, and at the end of the year, you owe more than you gain, what the fuck was the point? All you did was waste your time. You got yeah, addicted totally. to caffeine and nicotine staring at your screen, <laughs> fucking DJ and your wife left you. And now the IRS <laughs> gets all your money. Like, come on. No good. It's a downhill spiral, man. It's almost <laughs> as bad as sports betting. <laughs> it's pretty much the same thing. It's it's like uh, I did another thing that HODL sort of helped me come to the realization to and a couple of the other Bitcoiners. I'm like Brad Clubhouse. therapist. You can tell <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was that I'm I'm I've got like an addictive personality. I didn't realize that my my, you know, obsession with following the DeFi market so closely and the, and the altcoin market so closely. Part of it was that I was like um, triggered by all this stuff happening because I'm in this as like a financial activist sort of like value investor type of mindset where I'm like, Bitcoin is going to change the world. Bitcoin is like. Uh, going to help so many people plus it's a opportunity for the average person to like level up themselves if they really understand what it is save in it for 10 years whatever you know understand the true value of what bitcoin actually is and use it as a you know decent percentage of their of their net worth to potentially uh gain from it becoming what its true value might end up being a million dollars a coin whatever it is so i'm really like you know looking at that as most people aren't capable to follow crypto markets right so i'm like triggered by all the stuff that's happening like seeing all these vcs pump billions into these pre-mined tokens and you use these crazy narratives like web3 and like this the evolution of the internet and we're giving you back the power and all this bullshit so that they can dump tens or billions of dollars and worthless tokens on people and stack bitcoin themselves it's sort of triggering right so i was like following it because of that but then also in 2017 i worked for a crypto fund I worked for Alphabet, which was like a you know pretty big crypto fund based in Dubai. They did a lot of ICO stuff, and I was on the ICO committee, so I was analyzing ICOs. I, was, I initially joined there as like the Bitcoiner guy, and then I'm like getting sucked into this like Wolf of Wall Street sort of crypto street stuff, and I did like 70 ICO analyses and like helped them raise a bunch of money. So I had a seat at the table in 2017. I saw the whole thing unfold, participated in it. And then I realized like that's where I became addicted to altcoin markets and following all this stuff because it is kind of very similar for most people to just sports betting or any other sort of gambling. And it's it's important for people to recognize. I know it sounds stupid, like I'm trying to moralize it or be make an ethical case or whatever to some people, but you should recognize within yourself, you know, if you feel really put off by what you're doing when you're trading all the time and you're like wrecking your body because you're following crypto so closely you're ruining your relationships you're getting mad and anxious all the time you're constantly checking your phone you're you're nervous and paranoid and constantly on edge you're probably addicted (laughs) so so it's not necessarily that you're an investor or you're a trader or you're whatever you're probably a gambler you're probably you probably should get some help and talk yeah. to hodl and he can help you help <laughs> you through this dark period of your life <laughs> yeah that, that's why like my my message anytime somebody asks me like should i trade or like is trading good or you know how do i get started trading the right way my answer is always like read two books the mental game of trading and trading in the zone and get your mind right first because if that's not in check 
everything else doesn't matter. Like you're going to lose money for sure over a long period of time. Yeah. You might get lucky here and there buy the right thing at the right time. But if you stay in the game long enough, it'll be just like a gambler in, in a casino. You know, you're, you're going to yeah. lose over time. I don't know that many successful traders, but you know, I do know a few and every single one I know uh, you know, is very disciplined and rules based. They're entirely mm -hmm. rules based and they will cut on a winning trade uh, just as quickly as they will cut on a losing trade if it fits into their paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. So if you are going to trade, that is the type of person you have to be. I can't, I can't fucking do that, man. Um, I'm emotional. I, I like swing for the fences on every single trade, right? Like when I was in college, I day traded and uh, I only had $30,000 in my account, which I thought I was rich at the time in college, right? And uh, I, I would trade the same $30,000 every trade. I would do the whole account <laughs> every trade because I was like, Hell yeah. I can make more money that way, bro. And I would just, <laughs> I would just fucking watch the ticks up and down. You know what I mean? Trade the one minute candles. And, uh, you know, I was doing well until I wasn't. And then I fucking lost everything, which is the story that happens to so many people. So I didn't start off as, you know, a dispassionate investor who's focused on the long term. It was hard won through, you know, some serious personal sacrifice and anguish. Yeah. I think everybody should go through that at a certain level. Not that I want people to lose money, but it's like, yeah, like, like step into the markets and get your yeah. ass kicked and see that it's not this like just easy shooting fish in a barrel thing. Like it's a challenge. And if you love it and you're will willing to put the work in awesome, you can build life changing wealth. But if you have that gambler mentality, you're screwed. Dude, if you're you 22 it, and you get wrecked for 10 grand, that's going to, that's like kill shot at 22. You're like, oh my God, I'm, I'm so broke. Right. But in the grand scheme of life, that means nothing. Mm -hmm. And I would way rather have you get wrecked at 22 than get wrecked at 42 for $2 million. Right. Like, yes. Which will happen to people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You look at the crypto confessions, Twitter account and the wrecked plebs telegram right. channel. I follow those all the time because I'm like, holy man, there's so many so many stories of people that just got absolutely destroyed by this the, this bear market in crypto and, and the one the one thing that separates this from even sports betting or whatever is all the Kool-Aid all the narratives like the celebrities and the the high you know highly influential Tim Ferriss and Kevin Roses and people like that that are actually tweeting out like supportive things about these Kool-Aid narratives in crypto and people just completely disconnect fundamental thinking from when they feel like they're part of a revolution. So it's very predatory to young people and a lot of like smart older people too and millennials or whatever. I've had so many friends that are just, they just had all their money in FTX. They drank all the Kool-Aid. They are seriously cons like convinced that like the NFTs are worth a million dollars a piece and all this stuff. And they're, they're like, they really believed in all these Kool-Aid narratives that were being fed. And, you know, to me, like looking at it all, it's like, this is this is different than penny stock trading or even meme stocks because there's a certain nihilism that is in most of the other markets that are pop propped up by the money printer, but in in crypto it's deceptive almost to the point of like they're doing it on purpose in a way it feels like because mm. they they're so incentivized all these companies Coinbase and all these people that have like a million followers on Twitter they're literally getting paid in tokens to shill to you and then dump on you when they say, I'm going to hold this thing for the long term. And then they, they just dump it as soon as you start buying in. Yep. So it's just, it's just really unethical. And, and like, it's no surprise that all these, I don't sympathize with Elizabeth Warren at all, but like, I kind of get where she's coming from when she's seeing the worst of what this industry is, is like presenting of like all these scams and the flash, bot. she's getting briefed on flash bots and like, front running on ethereum and mev and all this stuff yeah. mev and like how could you not look at that and compare it to previous historical cycles of where like wall street people just came in she was one of the people actually that was responsible for handling the 2008 collapse and she so she was kind of like she's got ptsd right now from dealing with the bailouts of 2008 like she was a very important figure in that where she was like grilling these ceos of banks and stuff so i kind of sympathize with her a little bit but i don't want to because she's also totally hates bitcoin for some stupid reason but yeah you know you, you did, gotta did you like see the look clip today it. about her talking about cbdc's again yeah that's, saying that that's, there's no did, use case for bitcoin and yeah she did she did what's called say she said the quiet part out loud like i mean yeah. that that really shows you what her motivation here is elizabeth warren is anti-freedom 
And she doesn't want the people to have a currency that's outside the control of the state. She wants the state to be able to monitor and control everything. And, you know, there's there's sort of two schools of thought right now. It's like there are these people who seem to be in control of our government who are hurtling us towards, you know, the Orwellian future where every transaction is surveilled and traced and we're monitored at all times. And, you know, and then there are people who are building freedom tech. And that looks like open source AI and, and Bitcoin and open source communications, you know, so I, I think the future is sort of TBD, but like this, uh, this conversation is far from over, although we are going to end up with the CBDC eventually, there will be one. I mean, the world is moving digital, you know, the vast majority of dollars are already digital anyway. I mean, how often does somebody hand you uh, a paper dollar bill anymore, right? We're all yeah. just swiping plastic out here. That's, that's digital money already, right? Them codifying it into a CBDC is just making it official, really. Yeah, as long as people know the difference between like a CBDC and Bitcoin and like what the value prop is there, I, I don't know. I just, I don't know if I see it taking off in the US. I mean, I know there's some states where the governors are mm. already trying to make it illegal and um, I don't know. They'll have, to, they'll have to get sneaky. They'll have to find a sly roundabout way to do their <laughs> Their CBDC, yeah, um, you, you, they're you not going to be able to UBI check in CBDC or whatever. Well, that, that's that's how it'll go. They'll, people will get bribed in order to take the CBDC, right? So, like, if you're, um, you know, it'll be like Worldcoin. Yeah, if you get ten thousand in Stimmy for taking the CBDC, most people will take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 10, 000, I mean, 10, we've already seen how people yeah. are willing to give up their eyeballs to to Worldcoin just to oh, get yeah. a little bit of shitcoin tokens. So, yeah, I mean, if you promise 100%. people real dollars, right? Oh my God! Yeah, I'll give you my blood sample. I'll, you know, whatever. Dude, these these currency wars are are crazy, man. Because it's like you you look at the Elizabeth Warrens of the world and and people that are you know hawking anti freedom you know surveillance tech on you, and you go, well, I I don't want to be associated with that. I don't like that. And then you hear the crypto pitch, and you go, you know, well, that sounds great. It's freedom. It's decentralized. It's open source. And then you find out that a lot of the people over there are, are wolves who are trying to fucking eat you. And by the mm -hmm. way, if you're ever in a, a shitcoin space, an altcoin space, and you hear somebody who doesn't sound confused, because oftentimes people sound deeply confused. If you hear a guy who doesn't sound confused, that guy's about to fucking eat you. That, that guy's the wolf, right? <laughs> Anybody who's got clarity of thought in shitcoin land is here to take your lunch, right? Mm -hmm. And so you go over there and everybody's trying to steal from you and they, they seem almost worse than the, the, you know, the central bank digital currency people, like that, than the, poli the political elite. And it, you hear these Bitcoiners and they're a bunch of assholes who are going, everything's a fucking scam. Fuck these people. Fuck the CBDCs. Fuck the shit coins. You're stupid for buying this. Don't trade. Just hot, yada, yada. And you go, man, these, these guys are such dicks, but like maybe they're right, right? And like ultimately over time, I think more people are coming uh, to that side and realizing that like, yeah, it, it it is hard to understand because there's so many layers of ob obfuscation around Bitcoin because currency is war. I have a friend who, who said uh, there's no friends in money. He said there's only war and death. And I was mm. like, God damn, that's the truest quote I've ever heard in my life, right? And so like, yeah, when you enter into the space, Nobody here loves you. Nobody here is taking care of you. Everybody is out for themselves. Uh, and you're going to have to, you know, caveat emptor, buyer beware, like really pay attention and be scrupulous about everything that you're hearing, every single thing. Yeah. And yeah, unfortunately, you have to just do the hard work of diligencing everything you come across. Don't yeah, pay attention. Learning. You know, yeah, learning. Yeah, exactly. Right. Le yeah. Learning adversarial thinking, right? Yeah, and absolutely. It's, it's, it's kind of a nihilistic view, but it's, it's true. Like you have to assume everybody's trying to take your money because mm -hmm. they are. <laughs> well, it's it's a very American view too, right? It's like, uh, you know, I'm going to be over here with my land and my guns and I'm <laughs> growing stuff on my land. Now, if there's a, you know, if you need a little help neighbor, sure, I'll help you. But if you come here on a body, I'll fucking kill you. Right. That's America. <laughs> right? And so that's Bitcoin is a lot like that. So it's like, we're happy to help out we're, we're good neighbors. But good fences make good neighbors, all right? Don't come here fucking uninvited. You know what I mean? Well said. So <laughs> let me ask you guys this, because you've you've been in all the spaces. You've you've been in the arguments. You've, you know, you've talked to a lot of people. I tend to avoid a lot of stuff um, just to kind of simplify my life. But <laughs> do you, have you guys come across anything in the altcoin space that you're like, you know what, that's not a scam or that does have the possibility of long-term survival, or do you guys think everything's a scam? Yeah. So 
<laughs> yeah. See, this is the thing. <laughs> I, I want to give you an answer that's like, well, you know, Chris, there's a few things that are, you know, actually, I mean, this project and that project. And I want to I want to come off reasonable. Right. But the truth is that would be a lie. And it is all fucking scams. And it's kind of hard to believe that it is all scams. But it is. There's twenty six thousand cryptocurrencies and literally all of them are scams except for Bitcoin. It's kind of like monotheism. Right. It's like it, there's one God, whatever, whichever God you believe in, that's the one God and all the other gods are scams. That's a lot what it's like in Bitcoin. And what we've seen is that over the years, the new shit coins, they pop up, they, they become a top 10. They have a lot of promises. Then the founder goes to jail. Then a new, a new bunch pop up. They have a lot of promises. They become a top 10. Then the founder goes to jail. I mean, how many times do you want to watch that story play out where you go, you know, oh man, I bought a blue chip cryptocurrency. It's going to the moon. And then your fucking guy that you bet on goes to fucking jail. A lot of people <laughs> thought Sam Bankman Fried was the smartest guy in the room. A lot of people thought Do Kwan was the smartest guy in the room. A lot of people thought CZ was the smartest guy in the room. A lot of people think Vitalik Buterin is the smartest guy in the room. None of it is true. All will go to jail eventually. Maybe Vitalik will, you know, remain unscathed, but everyone else is going to jail. All right. Brad. Unless they comply. I mean, like, yeah. So, so the thing about it is it's, it's uh it's use cases that i i sometimes look at use cases and think okay that's legitimate so like a stable coin if mm -hmm. somebody's in nigeria and they've got a cbdc where the bank is trying to the central bank's trying to force them on this e-naira and there's you know somebody out there offering to give them a usdt on tron in exchange for some cash naira and they decide to do that and they download a tron wallet i don't even know what they're called and get some usdt they're legitimately that's a legitimate use case where they're protecting themselves maybe they don't know what bitcoin is maybe they don't want to deal with the volatility of bitcoin they just want to get dollars so in that sort of way i could see there's a use case for stable coins the same with like digital securities if people are really passionate about upgrading markets and having better you know uh you know the dtt the dtcc has kind of shown its hand in the in the whole gme case with the naked shorting and the all the unconstitutional like illegal stuff they allowed to happen with the gme and and robin hood so like yeah it makes sense to have more transparent open settlement for digital securities you can trade more like uh you know 24 7 like like bitcoin does that's a use case i could see is legitimate some people really like to have their game items on in a wallet for some reason like you know they already spend there's billions of dollars being spent on Fortnite or um, Counter-Strike skins. So like, obviously there's a market there for people to buy and sell game assets. So sure, you want to own your game assets, fine. That's a use case I could see. Digital art, same thing to a point. But like the tokens is where, it. this is where it's obfuscated because the tokens are completely unnecessary. Yes, a decentralized network for communication makes sense, but that's where Bitcoiners are coming in and building all these use cases without tokens, without blockchains. You don't need a blockchain to have decentralized messaging and decentralized identity. You can do it with public private key pairs. Like the Noster mm -hmm. community is proving that out. Noster's got hundreds of developers, hundreds of thousands of users, uh, tons of node runners. It's a distributed, decentralized network with no shitcoin, no blockchain, none of that stuff. AI is another thing. You don't need a blockchain and a token to make distributed open source LLM available for the world. So it, there's a lot of use cases that I see are valuable, but you can do all that stuff on Bitcoin. Like, uh, but the crypto people and the venture capitalists don't can't pre-mine that shit and then dump it on you for 100x gains. So they totally disregard everything. So you see friend.tech come up. And like people like Travis Kling are out there shilling friend.tech saying it's better than Noster. But like he has never even used Noster. And it's just because he's probably got a bag of whatever's, you know, company invented that thing. Yeah. And it's all the crypto guys are shilling this stuff. So you can totally see the perverse incentives of tokenization where the use cases are better without the barrier and the friction of a blockchain on a Bitcoin adjacent layer. So you've got tons of activity in the bear market where Bitcoiners are out there building all this really awesome technology. And I think it's going to be pretty surprising when in my thesis, which I still think is going to happen when the, the market finally capitulates to the idea that tokens are a good idea when it comes to like 
adding extra barriers and financializing everything. Most people don't want every piece of their life financialized and put on a token and trade it. It just it just adds extra friction and extra mental stress to thinking about like, oh, now my house token is going down in value <laughs> instantly. So like, you know, having decentralized networks makes sense. These use cases are legitimate, but there's liquid network. There's RGB, which is a layer three on top of Bitcoin. There's the frost network coming on top of lightning network. There's the tar taproot assets network that's on top of lightning network. There's all kinds of second and third layers being proposed, like BitVM and uh, Prime. And there, like, there's literally so many really interesting, incredible developments happening in Bitcoin and Bitcoin adjacent spaces. Tether and, and, and Bitfinex are working on the whole um, decentralized identity space as well and decentralized file storage. No tokens. Mm -hmm. Jack Dorsey's got... The, the TBD company, which is working on decentralized identity, file storage and retrieval. So it's all like Arweave and Filecoin and IPFS and all this stuff. It's totally unnecessary. And so Bitcoin companies and Bitcoiners are building out Noster and all these other techs that will show that like these use cases are real. But all these VCs and stuff shilling tokens on top of these narratives is completely scammy. And as, as so in Hoddle's view, yes, majority of the stuff is all scams in that way that it's just they're bolting tokens onto use cases that don't need tokens. And they're just doing it because they've got they got a pre mind. And it's the same exact people that ruined Web 2.0 because they turned it into surveillance capitalists like Panopticon have now pre mined <laughs> Web 3.0 and told telling you that it's oh, it's 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 the Web evolved for the people but they've already, they already own it the same people that own web 2.0 own web 3 so it's just yep. a big grift it's a big yeah. scammy grift. the devil's always in the details too it's like take ripple as a example right okay so like ripple is you know um people buy ripple on the idea that banks are going to have an interbank settlement blockchain they probably will have an interbank settlement blockchain right or something like fed now right like so that yeah bank payments are slow and retrograde they're going to get a lot faster over time why in the hell would the bank consortium that are together in a, in a cartel, these are made guys, right? Why would they get together and cut Ripple, some, some fucking asshole startup in on the deal and make a bunch of retail idiots rich in the process? That story doesn't make any fucking sense, right? Yeah. They're not going to do that. They're never going to use Ripple, right? <laughs> Ripple is selling you a fake idea with a fake or a real idea with a fake token attached to it. And that's basically every everything in shitcoin land is that. I I know like some people are hearing this and they're they're thinking one of a couple things like one you guys just don't get it <laughs> or two like this is super depressing and what the hell am I even doing in crypto or three like hopefully more people in this third camp which is like yeah I I approach everything with the adversarial mindset and assuming like Hoddle said assuming everything's a scam. And then kind of going to Brad's view of like, okay, well, where's the, where is the use case? And then like hunt for those perverse yeah. incentives, right? Is there a use case here? Cool. Awesome. It could work, but is somebody fucking it up with, with weird tokenomics or a pre-mine or like yeah. something unnecessary that doesn't need to be there just so they can get rich, right? You, you need uh, to know how the money is being made, right? And it should be relatively simple. So you, you should be able to like, okay, take a business like Google, right? Google makes a fucking shitload of money. How do they make their money? Search. It all comes from search, right? Search is like the one trick pony that, you know, uh, is the engine that built Google. Okay. Very easy. Any idiot can figure that out. People search on the internet. Google's the number one search engine. People pay Google for ads. Simple, right? But when somebody comes in with a, a sales pitch to you about, you know, how you're going to get rich off of investing in this and they can't tell you how or why the money is being made or who, who benefits from what, um, just be very, very, very circumspect in that scenario. Because if you can't figure it out in about three seconds, like it really should not be complicated. Yeah. If somebody tells you they got rich off of this or that, you should be able to think, okay, what'd you get rich off of? And they should be like, oh, well, I bought Facebook stock early. And you go, oh, well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's the easy one, right? If it's not that simple, then you're probably in the middle of a scam, like yeah. nine times out of ten. Agreed. So let me let me let me also sort of like give you the nuanced answer, if you don't mind, too, because I know there you're saying there's people that are thinking like these maxis just don't get it. They're Luddites. They don't get DeFi tech, whatever. OK, yep. 
So here's the way to think about that, because I, you know, I, I get I sympathize with the idea that new people are coming in and they're thinking like they're going and looking at like, I don't know, Ave or, or any of these other lending protocols or whatever. And they're looking at it and they're coming at it from the perspective of like these protocols earn revenue. So they're legitimate capitalist businesses, if you know whether or not they're crypto people or not. They look at it and they're like, oh, well, this protocol has a billion dollars in lending going on and they're making fees on it. So the token, even though it might be looked at as an illegal security in the United States, the token shares back through the smart contract dividends or or profits on the fees, right? So if you're holding Aave token or one of these other tokens for, for any of the popular DeFi protocols, um, you're going to get some fees shared back to you based on what the protocol earns. And in some cases, like there's like Ponzi sort of esque elements built on top of it, where the DAOs are all competing to buy the tokens. And then the gut, they use governance like arbitrage or whatever to allocate more of the fees to the, to the token holders. So like, some of them are governed by DAO votes and so it's kind of like corporate takeovers are happening in DAO world and DeFi world. So, okay. So if you're in that perspective or you're looking at this stuff and you're saying some of this is real, it's, it's not just a shit coin token that's built off phantom value and narratives. There's fundamental value happening. And, but Maxis can't argue with that one, right? <clears throat> well, I won't argue necessarily with that, but I will say that <clears throat> it's extremely overvalued. Because you got to stop drinking Kool Aid when it comes to these DeFi protocols. If you're analyzing this stuff, you got to like analyze it compared to what it is. This isn't like Ethereum, the token. This isn't like Bitcoin. This isn't. This is more like a company. And what do you? How do you analyze a company? You do fundamental analysis and look at the PE ratio. And if this thing has revenue, and that's why you're giving it value, you got to look at the PE ratio. And if the PE ratio is a hundred x or a thousand x you're the sucker and you're drinking Kool-Aid. And most of these DeFi protocols, their tokens are like overvalued to the tune of way more than even the bubbliest tech stocks. So yeah. even though we've gone through major, major bear market and a lot of this De DeFi stuff, and some people have capitulated to this narrative, even the stuff that's could be looked at as like a, a value investor sort of capitalist investment in the crypto world is extremely overvalued when you compare it to Bitcoin. And people are using these fantasy narratives of like all of the derivatives in the world are going to get traded on a layer two of Ethereum. So I might as well buy the layer two token because all that value is going to accrue to the layer two token. No, that's not the way that you analyze it. All these layer two tokens of Ethereum are cannibalizing each other and cannibalizing Ethereum itself. All of the value in Bitcoin, all of the people that are that are buying Bitcoin and building on Bitcoin, they are not competing with the Bitcoin token for value accrual. All value accrues to the Bitcoin token, to the Bitcoin asset in Bitcoin. The million Bitcoiners that are holding and building and educating and, and building around Bitcoin are all doing it. They're putting all their monetary energy towards the number go up of Bitcoin. Thousands and thousands of these tokens in Ethereum crypto world are not only competing with each other, you got Solana is a more scalable, better version of Ethereum. So you got all the cryptos, people competing over what's better, the ETH token or the SOL token. But then you, know, you also have every entrepreneur that's building stuff on top of these tokens. They're competing, they're sucking and leeching value and cannibalizing the potential you know, TAM of ETH, the token or SOL, the token. And then you've got all the, because these things aren't scalable, you got the layer twos and the layer threes. And like Lightning Network has no token, Liquid Network has no token, RGB has no token. None of the scaling technologies of Bitcoin have a token. It's all going towards value accrual of BTC. So people are totally discounting the fact that all of these crypto things, even if some of them are legitimate, are eventually cannibalizing all of everything. They're competing for investor allocation and they're, they're overvalued. So that's one thing that people really should think about when, when it comes to the next bull run, if it happens. I just think way too many people are underappreciating that like there's there's a there's a ceiling to how how much value can go into these things. I I have a saying, um, don't get fundamentaled. So don't get sucked into the narrative and look at fundamentals and try to value crypto stuff like a stock. Um, I, I yeah, there's so much nuance and so much to unpack in what you said, but I, I think it all comes back to the point of like 
it's all narratives that drive price of most of the crypto shit, right? So it's like narrative first, technical charts second, and then fundamentals. But if you buy into the, the, the fundamental idea and you believe it's going to succeed just based off of fundamentals, that's where you end up just being a long-term bag holder of stuff that just dies slowly over time. Like you said, totally. I mean, the, the value just get, gets kind of picked at and, and chewed up and distributed. And so, yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, I, Keep it simple, uh, Hoddle. Like you said, if you can't understand it in a few seconds, it's probably a scam. Well, you know, um, you know why it's insidious, Chris, is because a lot of people listen. A lot of people like to play the lottery, and that's totally fine because the lottery is like two bucks or five bucks for a ticket or whatever. You know what you're getting, and what you're buying for your five bucks is basically a little dream. And the little dream is, oh my god, when I buy the lottery, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm, and that lasts for two days, three days, four days, mm -hmm. however long until the drawing is, right? But when you buy one of these shit coins and you get sucked into the shit coin sales pit, you bought a lottery ticket that never le like it never leaves you alone. You're trapped forever and it slowly steals your Ooh. soul, you know? You know, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's really that's what analogy. it is, right? Yeah. So yeah, if you're gonna gamble, just go to the fucking casino, dude. I like to play blackjack. It's great. You know what I mean? I'll meet you there. Like, don't gamble with your financial investments and tell yourself that you're not gambling because oh, I well, I looked at a chart. And there's a reverse Fibonacci. Like, shut the fuck up. You know that's fake. We all know that's fake. You're just making stuff up, you know? Well, I, I think there is something to market cycles and knowing, like, how to actually trade based on a trend. Like, I've made a shit ton of money trading sure. altcoins. Totally. But if you look at the amount of, like, say, YouTubers that do the whole, like, here's the next 100x coin or whatever. Ugh, they yeah. are literally, like, selling lottery. Pure narrative. Pure narrative. Pure, narrative, pure yeah. lottery ticket. Like, that is very different. And But you can see just by the subscriber count and the views that most people want that. Most people just want some guy on YouTube to say, here's what yeah. you buy, and then in six months, you're going to be rich as hell. Totally. Right? So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm... I'm constantly conflicted. I'm like, do I want to keep making YouTube videos and talk about crypto? Because I know how to do it and I know how to build wealth, but I know like, again, most people aren't going to do it. So I don't know. I, I, I go think, back you know, and your, forth with it. Your channel, you know, you put out a lot of disclaimers. I think you, you, you know, you give people the appropriate way to think about these things. I think that's totally fine. Everybody's a big boy, big girl. They can make their own decisions. Right. And I think you just got to know that if you're, you know, thinking about trading, that you you just entered the hardest trading game in the world where there are no guardians looking out for you. There are no regulators. It's the fucking Wild West. I mean, you're literally, when you trade cryptocurrency, you are playing poker in a fucking Wild West saloon and you're <laughs> drunk and it's midnight and your back's not against the wall. Do you know what I'm yeah. saying? You're going you're gonna to get fucking stabbed. And That's what be, because there's so much dumb money in it, like for people that know how to trade, it's actually easier than say like trying to day trade like the S and P 500 totally. because yeah. that's just filled with professionals and algorithms that'll eat your lunch. So yep. yeah, I mean, I, I love trading crypto. It's fun, but yeah, I mean, most of it is just. By the way, in air. crypto, and, another thing you got to pay attention to is like the exchanges are trading against you. You don't think CZ was trading against you, right? Or Sam? We know for a fact Sam Bankman Fried was trading against you. I mean, that came out in the documents in court, right? Arthur Hayes was trading against people with Bitmax. So if you're on one of these high leverage shitcoin casinos, uh, be very wary about what you're seeing in the order books because most of it is a fugazi. Most of yeah. it is fake. Right? A, a lot of it, for anybody that's old enough to remember the, um, the Forex hype back around like 2010, you know, all those... Uh, kind of small Forex brokers, they were doing the same shit. They had like a few different books. They had the the A book, which was like people that they were just trading against. And then people that really knew how to trade, they would just front run them. Yep. So yeah, th there's a lot of games, man. You got to be careful. Don't day trade because you'll get your lunch taken. You got to hold for longer periods of time. But then <laughs> you run the risk of like rug pulls and things like that. So there's a, there's a fine line in there. It's Chris, tough, man. Do you want to bring up that second tweet I sent you? This is, this is kind of relevant to the discussion around like um, structure. Yep. And it's it's the chart of, uh, there you go. Yeah, just put that up. So a lot I've heard in the last, especially couple of months that, uh, you know, from a lot of the high followed crypto accounts that lost their money in Voyager and FTX and Luna and all these things, but somehow still have reputation amongst their followers. 
I've heard them talk about how shit coins are doing so well and they're beating Bitcoin and, you know, it's alt seasons back and the alphas <laughs> and the alt coins. So I was like, no, guys, like, no, nope. you know, they're, they're using Bitcoin dominance as the um, measuring stick there. Right. And the one thing that people need to realize if they haven't yet is that you have to remove the the wrapped Bitcoin the or sorry, the wrapped ETH and the dollar wrapped tokens, anything wrapped that's not, you know, a real altcoin has to be removed from the altcoin, you know, the Bitcoin denominate, the Bitcoin, um, uh, what the hell is that called again? Do the market dominance, cap. Bitcoin dominance index. Yeah. Because because if, if you're going to look at the Bitcoin dominance index, you got to remove all the stable coins and the extra wrapped tokens that count twice against Bitcoin, like wrapped ETH, you know, it's mm -hmm. like basically SD ETH and all that stuff. So when you do that, I ran the numbers. Bitcoin is outperforming when once you do that. I mean, if you look back at the, the chart, it's like right there. Um, look, Bitcoin's up 100 percent. The altcoin index is only up 46 percent. Yep. So I had this argument with uh, with um, Mario and uh, Rand Neuer and all these guys on one of his spaces because they're like, no, look, you know, look at look at Solana. It's up 300 percent. I'm like, you guys are just cherry picking the one coin that most people weren't in at the top yeah. of what I think yeah. is, is going to go down. But if you're, if you're advocating for people to index, look what you're doing. You're going to either pick the wrong coin and probably get wrecked. You're not going to be the, 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 the sweetheart story that chose the right coin at the bottom and held it until now and didn't get rug pulled. Not only is it Bitcoin outperforming, if you look at the drawdown of Bitcoin and start from there, Bitcoin's outperforming. It didn't go down as much. So Bitcoin is just outperforming in general. It's not to say that there's no opportunity if you're doing these strategies like you're talking about. If you know what you're doing, you're not drinking the Kool-Aid, you're using mathematical edge, you're emotionlessly executing your trades, etc. You can probably do good if you don't get rug pulled by you know a custodian or or a smart contract failure or whatever. You know, and you pay your taxes, <laughs> maybe you'll do okay, but the odds are against you and the narrative is wrong. Bitcoin is outperforming. So we're not in this market cycle because I know a lot of people think like it's a bull market. Altcoins do better than Bitcoin in a bull market. I'm my my thesis, my operating like working, you know, idea here is we are not in a bull market. Capitulation has not happened yet in crypto. Bitcoin has bottomed, it's in accumulation mode. But the final capitulation for the altcoins is, hap is, is yet to happen. And fundamentally, there's so many bad policy risks in crypto that it doesn't make sense to be over-indexing on the altcoins right now, even mm -hmm. if you see all this crazy activity in the meme coins and some yep. of the other coins. Because yeah. like, it's not over. Like macro, when you zoom out and look at where we are in the potential of inflation, high interest rates, the real estate crisis that's coming – People are not looking at speculating on shit coins. There's not going to be this massive wave of retail coming in to buy your bags. I mean, yeah. Bitcoin is being looked at by serious nation state, high net worth, sovereign wealth fund, $10 trillion asset managers now as a flight to quality, like Larry Fink said mm -hmm. from BlackRock. So no. Bitcoin is, en is, is entering into a different conversation in the world. And in, in a world where people are so focused on crypto Twitter and trading altcoins because they think that's where they're going to get their next bag to maybe even get more Bitcoin. Just consider the fact that we are not in a bull market and would you still be so allocated to altcoins as an investor, as a long hold? Or should you start thinking about Bitcoin as a completely separate thing? Mm -hmm. yep. And that's what we advocate for. Uh, just and keep saving in Bitcoin and keep it separate from all your speculative stuff. And and just to temper expectations on the Bitcoin side, too, I, I think we're probably, you know, yes, the price went uh, it's up over 100 percent over the last year. But we're probably still 24 months out from a Bitcoin all time high right now. Things are going to pick up, but, you know, between here and there. And, you know, they're going to get more bullish as we go, et cetera. And that's probably likely. Um, but don't be surprised if there is some big event where Bitcoin takes another 50% nosedive and probably in the next 24 months, it might take three 50% nosedives. <laughs> like Bitcoin is really volatile and, you know, you, you just, 
if you're trading it and you're positioned off sides, you're going to get totally wrecked. And also, again, when you think about trading Bitcoin, uh, something like 90% of the Bitcoin returns come on 11 days of the year. So if you're not invested in the market on those 11 days, you are not making the same returns as everybody else, right? So people that are hodling their Bitcoin, just buy and hold, they're in for the whole 11 days. People that are trading, you know, yeah, you could you could be off sides on one of those days, right? So just consider what you're, the forces you're playing with because, you know, you're playing with something that's very volatile and it's very difficult to trade and only the strong are going to survive this game, you know? Yeah, I have a couple of strategies that I run on TradingView. Let me just show you guys this. So I have um, a couple of different strategies that I can run just to look at like um, path performance of like if you, let's say you were like a dollar cost average guy and you bought every month and maybe you only did that when Bitcoin was, you know, 50% or more off of all time highs versus like I have another strategy that's called the buyer of last resort where it's like when Bitcoin washes out and it's, you know, in a, in the depths of a bear market, like we were doing back here on the COVID panic down into the 4k yeah. range. Like, what does that look like? So I think it, like being able to actually run the data and know what the performance of different strategies are, I think is really helpful for people to see. Otherwise, you're just kind of shooting in, in the dark and guessing. And totally. Brad, your point about um, Bitcoin dominance, like I actually wrote about this today in my newsletter, The Daily Doe, you know, talking about how, you know, on average, just like you said, like cryptos are losing ground. Like, uh, you're yes, you're going to have uh, the ability to cherry pick the odd altcoin that's, you know, outperforming. But on average, Bitcoin is still kicking everybody's ass. Totally. By the way, when you think about dollar cost average versus uh, lump sum in Bitcoin, you know, about 95% of the time, lump sum investing, uh, if you run a regression analysis on it, is better than dollar cost averaging. But 5% of the time, it's much worse. And unfortunately, in Bitcoin, uh, that 5% tends to be when everybody shows up and wants to get invested in, in Bitcoin, right? So yeah. like a lot of people like to lump sum <laughs> in at the top and, you know, they end up getting wrecked. And if you are one of the people that did do that, uh, the best strategy for you is to dollar cost average your way back down so that you'll be in yeah. profit sooner. Uh, where where I think DCA is helpful for people is like people that have cash flow. Maybe they don't have a lump sum right now that they can throw into it, but right. they're like, yeah, I have a couple grand free every month. I can put a percentage of that into Bitcoin. That's where I think on a, like a, a personal finance level, it just makes more sense. I've done it all. I've lump, I've lump summed. I've DCA. I've you know made very. I've made five dollar purchases. I've made very large purchases, right? And uh, for me as a buy and hold investor, like every price is a good price uh, for Bitcoin. But you know, if you're if you have a trader, if you're a trader and you have a trader's mentality, that's not true. So you know, you make your money at the buy. Everybody knows that, right? So like mm -hmm. your most important timing, in my opinion, is at the buy, not at the sell. Yeah, the sell is important too, but the buy is the most important. Absolutely. Yeah. So let me ask you guys this. Um, do you have any predictions for what's going to happen to Binance and Kraken and all the other yeah. altcoin casinos? Like, do you think they're going to survive? I, I, you know, we were talking about like market cycles and how, you know, after 2017, I didn't think we were going to get another shitcoin market cycle, but I, I couldn't have predicted NFTs and, and the DeFi wave and everybody like, it seems like all the crypto people are assuming that we're going to get another big boom and every we're going to get that all tides rising event. I think the odds of that are of happening are very low, but what do you guys think? Do you think Binance is going to continue to exist that trading volumes are going to come back in crypto or is it going to continue to fade or just shut down altogether? Yeah, I'll say my piece real quick and then I'll let Brad go because he has a more developed thesis, but I was the same as you, Chris. In 2017, I was like, this is insanity. Clearly, the market has learned from this. They didn't. I was taken, you know, I basically called 2021 correctly, except for uh, altcoin season, which was a total blind spot on my part. So I'm a little bit gun shy to say, like, you know, it's definitely not going to happen this time. But I do agree with you that the probability has never been lower. And I do think if we see some, I have a, I have a thread about this pinned to the top of my Twitter, but if we see something about this, I think it's going to be centered around identity. So I think identity is going to be a big deal. Awesome. Did you lose me? Nope. Oh no, it's just you, Brad. Uh, <laughs> Brad yeah, I think we're I think we're good. 
Yeah, anyway, I, I think identity is going to be I can't a big... see him anymore. <laughs> oh, there he is. Hey, right, I'm here. <laughs> it was just you, buddy. Um, I think identity is going to be a big deal, and I think if there is a bubble that's formed, it's going to be around identity. And what I haven't figured out about, because if you pay attention to everything that's coming out of leadership from Vitalik, if you look at the things that are popping in the bear market like friend.tech, um, you can see that identity is at the core of a lot of this. What I haven't figured out and what is needed for the bubble to form is how do you make identities tradable on the secondary, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe these are AI identities. Maybe these are, you know, the productive output of influencers. Like you get a share of Mr. Beast profits from his latest video or entrepreneurial endeavor. I don't know, right? But I, I know identity is the big container by which this <clears throat> bubble forms if it does form. Mm. Interesting. I could definitely see that as a narrative. Also, I mean, look, I, I know gaming has kind of been beat to death and we saw the whole like uh, play to earn thing implode. I still think there's something there, uh, at least like for another bubble. I don't know how sustainable it is, but I think gaming, I mean, there's so much money in it and there's so much yeah. time and like just attention that's on it. So I think that could we could see another bubble there. I don't know. What do you guys think? No, so gambling and gaming? gaming are like mac and cheese. They go together. Yeah. You know, it's just I don't people haven't figured out how to do it from a regulatory perspective yet. Go, Brad. Yeah. I yeah, I, I I'm not subscribed as much to that one. I, I think uh Chris, you want to pull up the tweet I just sent you in our chat? It's one of Hoddle's tweets that I liked from a couple weeks ago about killing sacred cows in the in the Bitcoin hmm. cycle theory that will uh parlay well into what I'm gonna say. But you wanna explain it, Hoddle? Yeah, sure. Basically, I think the two big um, confirmation biases that we had as Bitcoiners, as a collective unconscious, was we believed that 100K uh, Bitcoin price was guaranteed. That yep. was a big one. And then we also believed uh, that higher lows were, you know, a sort of sacred cow that they were sacrosanct. And what higher lows means is that you never go below the former uh, all time high. Right. So like the 2017 all time high was 20 and we went to like 15, seven or something. And in inflation adjusted terms, we went closer to like 12. So we were really beaten down like a motherfucker because of just, I think the level of graft and the level of scams, you know, Brad was actually early to this and he was telling me, you don't understand DeFi is such a big problem. You don't realize how big it's gotten. And I was like, Brad, this is a bunch of shit coins. Who gives a fuck, you know, whatever. But Brad turned out to be totally right. And it made it to the halls of Congress and everybody ended up going to prison. And, you know, that it was like very unceremonious <laughs> ending to the story. But I do think it's important to check your biases as an investor or as a trader and really have a level of meta analysis, which means thinking about your own thinking and being like, what do I believe? What is the what is the thing I hold most sacred about this trade or this investment that if it was to come unglued, I just wouldn't have an answer for that. And you need to know what that is about yourself. And you also need yep. to know what the market believes. Right. And I think those things are extremely important. And yeah. then one of one of the uh, you know the the conclusion of Hoddle's thread there was like the speculation on what's the next sacred cow or whatever that we, we're going to slay, mm, and yeah. the the next sort of bias that you have that. Uh, and what was it, Hoddle? You uh, yeah, so price, I think right now the bias right now the bias is diminished returns. So I think right. everybody is expecting a lower all time high this time. So like. Maybe they're expecting the Bitcoin cycle to top out at 120K, something like that. Uh, that. I think that seems to be like a consensus view, especially amongst the big money guys. Like, you know, we have TradFi here and that's a that's a blessing and a curse. We have sort of an ambivalent relationship with TradFi and the baby boomers just really don't think that Bitcoin can go to a million dollars. They don't really believe that in their heart of hearts. Right. But maybe 100K, 200K, you know, whatever Berkshire's done in the path, they believe they believe that that could be a thing. Um, and to me, I think, what that's going to cause in the market is that if enough people believe that we're basically going to see a sell off uh, at some lower number, like 120, 130, whatever. And then the price is going to rip exponentially higher. People who sold off are going to FOMO back in. That'll push it ever more higher. And we're going to get an actual parabola, which we didn't get last time around. Right. <laughs> so to yeah. me, I, I think I think that idea of diminished returns being, uh, you know, consensus could turn into, you know, this sort of dangerous parabola that catches everybody <laughs> off guard, you know? You know, and yeah, that goes I, to I the... Like, I was going to say, yeah. I like how you're talking about, like, pain here. And I think yeah. the market has a way of doing... 
it's best to cause pain to the most amount of people. If that's stopping people out, washing people out, like you guys said, nobody yep. thought it was going to go below the prior all time high. Well, that caused the most amount of pain. Also parabolic moves cause pain in the form of FOMO where people that aren't in are experiencing pain because everybody else is getting rich except them. So. I, th I think it's the market's going to cause the most amount of pain to the most amount of people for the most amount of time. You know, it's like the market is brutal. It's just brutal. Something you hear too often is, uh, you know, looking back at Bitcoin's history and something I heard from, from like, you know, Hoddle and the guys in clubhouse, 2020, 2021, 2022, talking about the CAGR, the compound annual growth rate. I'd never heard of that before. Oh, yeah. But, you know, that was a big thing that people were talking about last cycle. And even now people talk about Bitcoin's CAGR and it's like something like 144% if you look at it back to the beginning of Bitcoin when it had a price. And and this is to the heart, I think, of what Hoddle's talking about is like a lot of people talk about previous performance of Bitcoin in this crazy compounded growth rate that it's had that is unsustainable going forward and everybody expects that it's going to drop to like 40 percent and even that's crazy high um but what hodl's saying here is like you know it could actually be 140 <laughs> it could still blow melt faces you know blow minds and still be like 140 percent gagger over the next five totally. ten years which well, yeah. would be you might also have like more feast and famine in the Bitcoin Kager, right? So it might be, you know, there are a lot of years that are just like flat and then you might get a 1500% year and then yeah. flat and then negative and then flat and then 1500%, right? So it's like, it's a weird, volatile, crazy asset and uh, you got to be very plugged into it if you're going to trade it, you know? Yeah, I, I ran the numbers on five years, 10 years, and then from inception. And I, I think the Kager is probably going to get lower on average over time. It's definitely something you want to look at at a minimum of like a market cycle. Um, but yeah, when you, there's several different metrics we can use like compound annual growth rate, risk adjusted returns, um, you know, there's several metrics. When you look at all of them, it's like Bitcoin now has a decade plus showing that it's one of, if not the best performing assets in the world. And so I'm confused at anybody in the investing world that's like still saying Bitcoin's going to die or it's a scam. It's like, how much data, how much evidence do you need that this shit isn't going anywhere? And it just continues to be a magnet for investor capital. It's just I don't know. Some no, people totally. just won't ever get it. But I, I think for me, uh, being being honest with myself and yeah, I do have bias and I, you know, I'm a Bitcoiner and I'm, I'm I have a lot of my net worth in Bitcoin. Right. Um, when I looked, you know, I did this sort of analysis of the 2020s and obviously it's impossible to know going forward. But I was saying right now, from where we stand here, I don't see anything that is publicly available that's going to beat Bitcoin. Right. Like the AI startup thing is great if you can get into Anthropic. And it was great if you could get into open AI up until like three days ago, which now you're, now you're fucked. But, but before well, then, did you hear Sam's back? He's back now. We're he's back. back. We're back still back. Now. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, if you can get into those private investments that have crazy multiples, then yeah. yeah, that's that's fantastic. But for public market investments, like things that we as mere mortals have access to, I, I just personally don't see anything that's going to beat Bitcoin over this decade. So you should be really looking at your returns against what you think Bitcoin is capable of doing and be dead honest with yourself about if you're doing better or worse than you know the benchmark, which is just hodling Bitcoin. Yeah. And also, so, I mean, look, I, I know um, I, I believe in concentrated diversification, meaning like having conviction and yeah, going in heavy on something that you have a lot of conviction in, but also like for me, um, you've got to think about your own risk tolerance because I can't, keep, I think we talked about this last time, maybe like I can't keep anywhere close to hundred percent of my net worth in Bitcoin because I can't handle seeing my net worth go down 70 or 80% in the oh, bear markets. That's just my personal Chris. risk tolerance, right? It sucks so bad. It's so hard. It's brutal. <laughs> yeah. so, Fucking brutal. Chris. <laughs> so like, that's why I have this beard, you know, that's why it's what this, this patch is the, uh, where am I at? I can't do this. This is, is the, the 2017, 70% drop. This is the last one. Yeah, I feel that too. But, <laughs> you know, I wanted to kind of like uh, link it back, right, to your original question, which was what's going to happen to the markets, to the crypto markets. 
And I was thinking about, you know, Hoddle's uh, thought exercise and was like, what do I think the, you know, the next phase of this is going to be based on, you know, these assumptions and biases that we all seem to have. And I'm looking at it more from the perspective of the market, market participant biases. Like, and there's mm-hmm. two big ones that I've been thinking about. There's the one that um, it relates with HODLs actually is most, even Bitcoiners believe that because macro has been a big topic, you know, everybody decides to just become a macro person during the bear market. It's like this right. macro buzzword. Right? Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> what's the Fed going to do? Like who gives a shit? Right. But, but still people are following this very closely. All the, the inflation numbers and the interest rate changes and what's the fed going to do and what's the curve doing and all this macro shit and the euro dollars and whatever. And while yes, it's important to know as a, as an investor where things could potentially be heading in terms of recession and likelihood of risk assets doing good. I've been saying that correlation is transitory for a while. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say that like Bitcoin's correlated. So a lot of these macro people will just be like Bitcoin's correlated to the markets. If the markets do bad, Bitcoin does bad. And that viewpoint was like disseminated down into Bitcoin circles. And I hear that often from super bullish Bitcoiners or very knowledgeable Bitcoiners that seem to just accept the idea that if we go into a bad recession, Bitcoin's going to do really bad. And I just fundamentally disagree with that. I think that 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 like Bitcoin, yes, there's a chance that if we go into Great Depression 2.0, really bad, you know, unemployment goes to 15 percent, um, inflation stays high, interest rates do whatever. But like whatever happens, recessions here, maybe depression, whatever. I think even in the worst case scenario, this is one of the biases that we have that that Bitcoin won't do good. To me, I look at like the value of everything that Bitcoin is competing against. And it's real estate, the bond market, dollars as savings, all of the equity markets that are being treated as stores of value. And, you know, this is something that uh, Bitcoin Tina, love them or hate them for, for selling Bitcoin in the bear market, used to always say, and I still agree with, that most of these other markets have leaked the store, of, like the store of value premium in real estate, equities, bonds, et cetera, it's, it's like going to leak out of that and go into Bitcoin. Once people start to comprehend and grok what Bitcoin really is and what it represents in your portfolio as a reserve asset, not the global reserve asset we're killing fiat, dollars are going to die. You know, Sure, you can believe that if you want, but you don't even need to go there. You just need to think that Bitcoin will be elevated on the world stage as a choice in the global reserve asset conversation for sovereign wealth funds, corporations, central banks, and other high net worth investors and family offices. And if it's 1% of your reserve assets are in Bitcoin, that's Bitcoin becoming a global reserve asset on the world stage. Right now, Bitcoin's market cap is something like the total value of all Bitcoin is like 700 billion or something like 500 billion, whatever it is. All the gold in the world is worth 10 trillion. All the real estate in the world, something like 80 trillion. And even if you're just, I was looking at the Federal Reserve's, uh, you know, the FRED, you can go to the, the FRED and look at, you know, households, how much wealth is held by American households. Um, real estate is pretty massive and stocks are something like $20 trillion on the balance sheet of American households. That's just Americans. So you think that, you know, and that's down 30% from the highs already. So all of this store value premium is leaking out of things that are not supposed to be held as stores of value. Historically, if you look at the charts of PE ratios for the last like 70 years, we went to this point in 2021 where we hit the peak of the valuations of stocks as a, from a PE perspective. And Historically, you know, Jesse Felder talks about this all the time with the everything bubble. Historically, when you get PE ratio spiking in the, in the stock market, it means that everything is overvalued and it's going to come down. Well, not only did we hit that peak, but we then doubled it. So because of the $10 trillion in stimulus that they did during COVID, it went haywire in 2021. Everything went overvalued by like a factor of at least 2x what it was previously relative to other bubbles in U.S. financial history. So U.S. households, even after a 30% drawdown in 
equities and bonds and things like that still have about $15 trillion of excess value on their balance sheets. Bitcoin's total market value is only about 500 to 700 billion. Looking at it on the world stage, in a global recession or a depression or whatever, Bitcoin as a fundamental asset, as a hedge or whatever you want to call it, as a as a as a diversification, a concentrated diversification, whether it's one percent or five percent, as people start to realize what they own is overvalued and they slowly diversify into Bitcoin, we could see Bitcoin rise to a couple hundred thousand dollars per coin in a global depression. So this is something I've been thinking about a lot. I've been reading a lot about the depression. I've been reading a lot about previous historical bubbles in Japan and even in the US with the in the 90s with the derivatives. And I just keep kind of like initially I was a kind of like doomy about it. I was like, shit, man, when this recession really hits, I'm going to have to be prepared for another 50 percent drop in Bitcoin, maybe another 70 percent drop in Bitcoin. But I'm starting to realize as my beard grows that, man, I. Bitcoin's Bitcoin could survive and thrive in a global uh, yeah. depression. And that would be the ultimate sacred cow slaughter for all the like haters of Bitcoin and even all the people in Bitcoin who sold too much Bitcoin because they're trying to hedge against another 70 percent drop in Bitcoin because the macro conditions are so bad. So, yeah. you know, that's one big thing I think that could melt I, faces. I, I think th this is an interesting topic because there are a lot of moon boys out there, right? That are just like, Bitcoin's going to a million and it's because inflation, right? It's like, well, yeah, but it's so much more, there's so many variables when it comes to that. So I I, I tend to think of this like a, a chess game, right? Like there's several ways that this could go and like there's so many different variables and so many ways that we can map the chess pieces. And I do like to think about that because yeah, we've seen in historic over the past decade, when there have been stock market crashes, Bitcoin goes with it because it's been viewed as a risk asset. And when mm. stocks panic, you know, people panic and they, they feel like they need to be liquid. So they sell stuff like Bitcoin and stocks so they can survive, right? That's a very real thing that happens, but like what, what is the chess move or how does the game play out where it goes the opposite way? right? What does that look like? Like say there's a stock market panic, say there's a depression or a recession or something happens and a lot of assets in banking implode. crisis. Yeah. Banking crisis. Like what, what does that look like where people do actually flood into Bitcoin and on a dollar denominated value, it goes to hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. I actually don't think that would be a good thing because what would a million dollars do Right. Like right. what would a million dollar Bitcoin actually get you in the real world? Would your quality of life be higher? Would it well, be I don't lower? think we need to think about it from the perspective of a complete failure of fiat and a complete crash. Even just like I said, a slow deflation of the excess premium and the store of value premium in the things that are way historically overvalued, slowly mm -hmm. leaking back into something that's built to be the perfect store of value, which is Bitcoin. That could be like it could be a. Uh, not a, an implosion, but just like a, a, an economic recession, depression, whatever you want to call it, where it's not like you need wheelbarrows full of money to go buy a loaf of bread and you have Bitcoin, mm -hmm. but you can't do anything with it. It's just a, a long drawn out flushing out of the risk in the system and people reevaluating what value is and coming to the recognition that Bitcoin is valuable and they should hold more of it. And there's only 21 million coins and most of the psychopaths like Preston Pish says are not going to sell their Bitcoin for anything under, you know, whatever their number is, but definitely not here. So as people want to get some Bitcoin, it's just going to inevitably go up in price because we saw a 70% drop and we've had the strongest hands class of Bitcoin holders this last bear market that we've ever seen. I, yeah, I think Brad is hitting on something that's uh, crucial. We, we were having this conversation the other day, like um, a house at the beach right on the beach is worth $10 million, right? And like, yeah, sure. That's a great house right on the beach. They're not making any more beach. Totally get it. But now the houses behind the house on the beach are worth $10 million. And the houses behind that house are, are worth $10 million. And the houses behind that one. So you're four rows back from the beach and you're still paying $10 million. That doesn't make any sense. It's because people are using these assets as stores of value. People are, you know, this moneyness is leaching into everything. I mean, there's a reason why comic books and vintage cars and uh, Rolexes are all going parabolic every time they do stimulus 
And the reason is because people are trying to hide from the devaluation of the currency, right? And as we enter a world with more currency deval and more financial repression, um, the fact that you can take a billion dollars and stick it in your head or stick it in one of these, you know, calculators, right? And, and walk across a hostile border, that's a really, really, really big fucking deal. And so when we talk about Bitcoin doing bad in, you know, a, a repressionary environment, a depressionary environment, um, I think it's, I think the outcome is TBD, right? Like I'm not going to go full on the bull case and say it's going to be gangbusters and we're going to a million and I'm not going to go full on the bear case because frankly, I, I'm agnostic and I don't know what's going to happen, but I do know that we're living through a period in history that's kind of in a historical blind spot. Everybody wants to go back in time 40 years, 50 years. We're really much more, we're, we're back in time a hundred years. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is like when the aristocracy fell in Europe and modernization swept through. I mean, we're living through some really weird shit that's happening. I mean, look at the look at the AI drama recently. Like, I was listening to Ray Kurzweil, who was saying that we're uh, six years away from a computer passing the Turing test, which is when a computer is indiscernible from a real human being. Right? I believe that. I think he's right. And so yeah. we're barreling into uncharted territory. And yeah, I, I just don't think anybody knows what the world is going to look like. But I do know that. If I have my fucking Bitcoin on this goddamn calculator, nobody can take it from me, right? Hold Let's it closer it. to the camera. Um, you got your private keys anywhere around there? Can't yeah, see it. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Right? I, I think there's some black swans on the horizon that yeah. are impossible to predict. And I've been paying close attention to a lot of the AI experts and they're talking about, you know, any definition that you can come up with of AGI will probably be satisfied in the next year or two. That's kind of crazy to think about. And yeah. who knows you know, what the world One looks thing like. too, everybody needs to get ready for all of your private communications to be leaked on the internet. <laughs> Everything you've <laughs> ever said to in yeah. a text message or, or a DM or whatever, assume that's going on the internet. How are you going to handle that when you've been shit talking your friends to your other <laughs> friends and they go on this dark web site and they just search, what did Chris Dunn say about me when I you know, <laughs> didn't invite him to the party? And they can literally just read your messages. That's the kind of crazy freaking world we're going to live in in the next decade. Yeah. It's totally possible. Things are going to be like, totally messed just, up. Just think about like, I've been thinking a lot about like post labor economics, right? You know, right now the labor participation rates like 60 something percent. What happens if that falls to like 30% where like two thirds of like working age people just aren't looking for work. Like that's a very, very different world. Yeah. And I, I'm trying to paint these, like these chess games in my head. Like, what does that look like? And, and I hate to say it, or I love to say it, whatever it keeps coming back to verifiably scarce assets like Bitcoin and yes, totally. land. And I, I do still like stocks, right? I do agree that they get overbought, but I want to own equity in companies that make money. I if think I we're going to go back to a value investing world though with stocks. I think it's going to go back yeah. to like the Warren Buffett style of picking stocks rather than the FOMO Ponzi style of just injecting capital and stock buybacks and all this crazy shit we've seen over the last couple of decades. Well, Mike, Michael Saylor has a great um, framework around this, which is that you know, we went we went off of the gold standard in 1971. That's when Nixon closed the gold window and we we went on the fiat standard. So all of the dollars were backed by nothing. Right. Um, and for the first 10 years of the fiat standard, the default store of value became instead of being dollars, the default store of value became gold. Right. Uh, which made sense. We just came off the gold standard. Gold had a crazy bull market in the 70s. Then in the 80s, the default uh, 80s and 90s, the default store of value became bonds, right? Which made a lot of sense, full faith and credit of the U.S. government, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then now from, you know, sort of about the early 2000s onwards, after post early 2000s crash onwards, it's been equities, which have been acting as the default store of value. And if you look at like, you talk about recession, you talk about people, you know, losing their job, et cetera, like it's really going to take those job losses to bring down the equities because, the vast majority of people don't even know what they're buying. They don't even know what they own. They don't know what they hold. They're just passively indexing into everything via their 401k, right? I mean, that's like a large number of market participants. And so I, what I think, what Michael Saylor thinks, what Brad thinks is that we are moving into the era where equities no longer act as the default store of value. There will be price discovery in equities. Those passive flows will stop at some point. And we're going to move into the era of Bitcoin as the default store of value for the fiat standard. The fiat standard will still be here. Uh, it'll be digital. It'll be the central bank digital currency. But we're now going to have a you know store value that we can is the reserve asset to the reserve currency. So it'll be like 
the dollar will probably remain the reserve currency and Bitcoin will be the reserve asset, at least over the next, like, let's say 20 or 30 years. After that, TBD. We don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, that's an, so, that's an interesting perspective. I Could I also shift this to uh, once more? Yeah, go ahead. So the second thing, you know, like that's one thing. Bitcoin could perform well, you know, in, in, in this depressionary environments, recessionary environment, whatever, the world of disruption of AI and the labor markets, all that stuff. It, Bitcoin could do well because of all the reasons we discussed. Of course, most people, including myself, believe the base case is that they're going to stimulate and they're going to print. UBI is coming. And in that environment, of course, Bitcoin does even better. So like I'm just want to be real like they're gonna save the system they have to that's what they know it's there's they got one big can left to kick you know one big kick kick at the can and they're probably gonna do it and in that world bitcoin does well i'm just talking about if the shit hits the fan i still think bitcoin could do well but the other big sacred cow that most crypto market participants have is that alt season happens with a bitcoin bull run and I really think that we could be entering into the world where we were right, but we were early last time, where we didn't think there was going to be another shitcoin meme coin bubble. Um, I I think like the main thing was because the the SEC assumed back in 2018 and 19 when everything got wrecked and all everybody started suing each other and the VCs stopped funding things and Google and Instagram and Facebook turned off ads for ICOs and they started doing dozens of enforcement actions against the uh, perpetrators of ICO fraud and cryptocurrency fraud that they wouldn't have to invest the resources to take this to the courts and to actually get judgment because all this stuff falls under the purview of the SEC and they they're just going to enforce through or regulate through enforcement and so i believe that what they thought they were going to do cuz they're understaffed or the market took care of itself that they weren't going to just waste all the resources and come in and and then really clamp down on the exchanges because the market kind of fell apart and on its own. Mm -hmm. And so it's the SEC's fault that this bubble happened because they didn't come in and go to the courts and get the final decision on what is a security. And, you know, they didn't actually, uh, they, there is no path to register for Kraken and Coinbase. And, and they did play favoritism with Ethereum over Ripple. And there's all these things that the SEC did that is is problematic for, for crypto companies to try to comply because they actually really can't comply because what they're doing is not in compliance. So it's this weird... Um, pretzel that both the all the crypto companies are in and the sec is in and we're seeing that resolve right now and i think that what should have happened last time from the perspective of the constitutional way to handle this is happening right now um which is they're taking action they should have done it last time when it was a smaller market because now they're in this pickle where they're causing more financial harm to retail investors than some of the scam artists that perpetrated the fraud because they allowed the bubble to go so big that now they're taking action when this space is worth tens of billions of dollars when, when they should have done it when or hundreds of billions. It's literally it's worth hundreds of billions and Americans have tens or, or hundreds of billions allocated to it. So it is a bit of a, pro a problem, but. What are they going to do? You got to think of this game theory, you know, from the SEC's perspective. Are they just going to do the same mistake again? Are they just going to like, you know, crypto's blown itself up and look at all the fraud with SBF and all these exchanges? Are they just going to let it try to go away again? They can't. They made the ultimate mistake last cycle. This cycle, they're they're they're, they're just like the central bankers have resolve to crush inflation and really hurt Americans in the process by crushing risk assets and causing uh, people to like suffer financially, to, to be desperate for a job because there's too many jobs available and not enough people looking for jobs. They want to crush you. They want to crush inflation. They don't want to see the wage price spiral kick in. They want to crush you. That's what the SEC is doing right now. And it's it's a shitty position that they put themselves in. And all the crypto proponents are like, the SEC is un-American. They're against freedom. They're against innovation. But you know what? That's the exact same story that the, the Wall Street banks said in 2008 and 1990. And in fact, if you read this really amazing book by Frank Portnoy called Fiasco, it's an insider's take on what happened in the first derivatives bubble. Most of us don't know that there was a derivatives bubble in the 1990s. And it looked a lot like the shitcoin bubble. And it was really 
like big swinging dick energy where people are just out there selling garbage, toxic assets to pensions and uh, municipal funds and stuff. And people are just speculating and total nonsense. And it was all narrative driven and people were making tons of money selling it and it blew up. And then the regulators came in and said, we're going to clean this up. And all these freaking Congress people and lobbyists came in and said, you can't stifle innovation. You can't stop the derivatives market. It's American jobs are at stake, blah, blah, blah. And they succeeded. And they actually stopped the regulators from passing strict regulation against derivatives. And then what happened? And the next bubble comes and it blows up the entire freaking financial markets because of what they did in the night in the resolution in the in the late 90s and early 2000s of the derivatives bubble. So the regulators are looking at this right now and they're thinking we have to have resolve here. So that's why you're seeing them going after Kraken, going after Coinbase, going after Binance, going after the biggest on ramps and, and off ramps to these crypto exchanges. And it's hard to decipher is this like, what side should I be on in this? Should I be against the SEC? Should I be for all these Ponzi scheme token operators because they are actually getting infringed upon their rights and stuff? Whatever it is, it doesn't matter what side you're on and who you sympathize with. They ju You just should recognize that the liquidity is going to be either taken away or regulated and tamed. And just like every other bubble where, where whether it was the old the oil boom in the 1800s or the gold rush or like i said the derivatives in the 90s or the turn of the century uh stock boom with like the the consolidated oil companies and stove companies and all these uh bucket shops and stuff when something gets as big to where it starts to affect pension plans and average people the politicians have to come in and do something about it and yeah. whether the market gets completely shut down it usually doesn't get completely shut down. It usually just gets tamed and regulated. And so I think that's what we're going to see going forward in crypto. It's going to get tamed. It's going to get regulated. Yeah. It's going to look a lot more like the traditional exchanges and the banks. It's not that all the shit coins are going to go away and go to zero. It's just that there's going to be a big, huge uh, taming of this market. And so in that way, I believe that we will see a world where Bitcoin decouples, not just from risk asset traditional market stuff but also cryptocurrency because yeah. cryptocurrency is probably going to grow to multi-trillion dollar market cap at some point in the future but bitcoin could be a 20 to 100 trillion market cap asset that is is a digital commodity on the world stage with gold with real estate with dollars it's, uh, themselves as a store of value and crypto is on the world stage with penny stocks or tech stocks or or whatever yeah, I, I agree with you that they're absolutely doing what they can within their power to tame it. And I think it's going to be bifurcated where you have regulated stuff in the US. And then you have like the Wild West that kind of continues through DEXs and overseas Asian exchanges. Yeah, Chris, no, you're totally right. And it makes me kind of sad because, you know, there were, there were these videos that were coming out the last few years from uh, Charles Hoskinson and Cardano, the Cardano Foundation. And they were down in these rural villages in Africa, shilling these, you know, shit, absolute garbage shit coins to the poorest people on earth who can least afford to lose their money. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of this bad behavior is going to go and affect people in the third world. And, you know, it sucks. It sucks to see rural India get hit, Africa get hit, South America get hit. But that's, that's what these dudes are going to do. They're going to all flee to Dubai, run their empires out of there. And then try and avoid the long arm of the U.S. government, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, the battle's heating up. Um, I, I'm definitely on the side where I don't want people to get scammed. And that's why I do these videos. Right. And, and I think these conversations are so important, you know? So should the U.S. government be the world regulator? I don't think so. And I don't think they can. It's not possible. So at some level, it's, look, there's always going to be a scam. There's always another scam, right? Whether it's penny stocks, Forex trading, crypto shit coins, right? There's always something coming down the pipe and scammers are going to scam. But I think that my optimistic view is that there will be, like you said, Brad, like a regulated part of crypto that either trades on a stock exchange or some kind of centralized exchange, it, are they good projects or not? I don't know. Um, but I think we can all agree that no matter what happens with the crypto world, 
Bitcoin is in a class of its own. Hundred percent. Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I listen. I agree with you. Like, I don't. I don't like America being team world police. You know, but we are. We live inside of the world's largest <laughs> empire, and like those are the rules of the game. You know, the empire can reach you anywhere on Earth. There's not a goddamn place you can hide from it. Yeah, I mean, they just got four billion from CZ. Right. So exactly. Oof, man. All right, guys. Well, we've been going for over an hour and a half. We could probably start to wrap it up there, but I think we made some pretty strong predictions, ideas, beliefs, any other kind of final. uh, Should we do a top prediction before we go? It's always fun. Yeah, dude, do it. (laughs) Brad, you got to go first. (laughs) Oh my God. For, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I've been, you know, since 2021, you know, I, I, I was very aware of the problems with crypto going to cause a, a lot of collapse in, you know, the, the, a lot of these guys were holding Bitcoin in their treasury. And I knew that like Bitcoin is the most liquid thing that they're going to sell first and they're going to blow up and it's going to take Bitcoin down. So when Bitcoin was like in the 60 K range, I was pretty like nervous and out there saying like Bitcoin's probably topping here. I mean, I'm going to keep buying. I'm gonna, I bought the top, but I was very convinced it was a bubble the crypto bubble and the crypto bubble is going to blow up and that was going to drag Bitcoin down. So I was, I feel like I've got a good read on the markets over the last few years because I've learned so much and I've made so many mistakes. And uh, I I don't know, like at this point, I I know it's stupid, but I, I'm just buying and holding Bitcoin and I'm not trying to think where the top is going to be because eventually I think it's going to a million dollars. And my goal is to hold Bitcoin until 2030 at least. And I think it's going to be a million dollars by 2030. I don't know what path it takes, if the four-year cycles are going to repeat or whatever. But I do have probably, you know, 10, 20% of my Bitcoin that I'm probably going to want to sell if we go parabolic right away, just to sort of survive if we get into a depression and Bitcoin tanks or whatever. But the majority of my Bitcoin position, I'm holding it geographically just distributed and multi-sig so i can't access it so you know that i you know if, if i was to say where would i sell bitcoin maybe not where's bitcoin going where would i where would i sell some bitcoin to like you know take a nibble off the top and start you know taking little chunks off here and there uh, i'd say i'd probably start selling a little bit of bitcoin like 150 something like that like hodl said you know that's the, the sacred cow that i'm one of those people that are like you know bitcoin <laughs> bitcoin's probably not gonna have a parabolic run this time but i'm not gonna make big moves i'm maybe one percent or something like that or half a percent maybe sell some and then see what happens and then i could see it going to two three four hundred thousand dollars this cycle you know in the next 2025 2026 something like that so let's say that's my answer uh three hundred thousand four hundred thousand <laughs> <laughs> all right Otto, what about solid. you solid um so yeah i i do think that my thesis i outlined a little earlier in the show is going to play out i think we're going to have this diminished return uh sort of you know this diminished return belief get get popped and when that happens people who sold and people who were sidelined will fomo back in that will bring in a wave of new buyers um, I also think the order of magnitude that where we're at in the crypto cycle is going to put us on a footing like we've never seen before. So if you think about it, like 2017, there were about, let's say, let's go all the way back. 2013, there were about a million participants here, right? 2017, there was about 10 million, right? And then 2021, there was about 100 million. So we're we're basically moving up in order of magnitude every bubble. Every time things get frothy, we move up in order of magnitude in terms of saturation of the globe. Which means that the next time around, we're going to have a billion people here, a billion, okay? And there are going to be more Michael Saylors, more billionaires. Bitcoin's a monetary asset. More money is going to flow in from, you know, the the BlackRock team. I mean, you got you got the iShares team out there shilling Bitcoin. It's going to take the place of gold in a lot of people's portfolios. That's a really big deal. So I think this thing is going to get extremely frothy. And if the thesis I outlined plays out, where people like Brad start to take profits at 150K, 200K, whatever it is, right? And then, you know, we see a reduction in Bitcoin and then it comes roaring back and people are going, oh shit, this is the moment. It's going to a million dollars. I got to get back in. We could actually legitimately see it take a run at a million dollars. So my prediction is we are going to see the diminished return bubble get popped, the belief get popped, and then we're going to see Bitcoin take a run legitimately at a million dollars 
this time around in 2025, 2026. Wow. Damn. Nice. All right. Well, I'll give you my final thoughts on that and then we'll wrap it up. Um, Can you show us on a chart too? Perfect. There we yes, go. I love yes. Chris and his charts. So I wrote about this the other day in the Daily Doe, uh, which is our newsletter that we put out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Go check it out, everybody. Um, but I was talking about the having event and kind of just some ideas of where price could go. Um, obviously, you know, these these pie in the sky ideas, like, yeah, there, there's so many variables. I don't know how to like really predict that. But one thing that I can kind of quantify and look at the look at a chart is like, well, how does Bitcoin's price perform like a year after the halving? Mm. And if we say that, like, let's just say that price is going to be flat from now to the halving, let's say it's around like 40,000. And let's say it's, you know, we get a similar move to prior market cycles. That kind of puts us around the 160K range. So I've got targets everywhere from 120 to 180. So let's say 160. That's kind of middle of the road. All right. Okay. Yeah. So we got Brad's in the middle. Chris was the lowest and I'm, uh, I'm at the high end. So we got to reconnoiter in like a year or two and see who was right. Let's do it. And if Bitcoin's mm -hmm. at like 200 bucks, then we'll just get some whiskey and commiserate. <laughs> let's let how about if Bitcoin's at a million bucks, uh, we'll get some really good whiskey and celebrate. Nice. On your fun. yacht. Of course. <laughs> yeah. A hundred percent. No, we'll do it on Michael Saylor's yacht. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> Dude, cool. can I say, Chris, by the way, one thing I love about you is that, you know, you're a trader, you're on a trading channel, and yet you allow me to come on here and talk shit about trading, which I just think love shows it. an incredibly open mind. And, you know, you're always very even keel when we talk. You always have good logic behind your thinking. And I just I appreciate what you're doing because there are so few like you in the mm -hmm. trading community. It's basically like you're like a, a unicorn here, you know, oh, <laughs> like thanks, every man. other guy is like. <laughs> Deeply well, convinced about what's going to happen, you know? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm like everything, right? I'm a hodler, I'm an investor, and I'm a trader. So, like, Smart. I can I can kind of empathize with all the views, and and I just I just say I don't know what's going to happen, and I have different capital buckets for different possible outcomes. So, hundred percent. Hopefully, I, I don't get crushed or left behind, no matter what happens. So that's totally. kind of my attitude, and I, I appreciate you guys coming on. I mean, you've got, you know very strong opinion opinions that I think are just very well thought out. And so no matter if somebody agrees or disagrees with you, I think everybody should know where you're coming from. Yeah. Me and Brad, I mean, you should take this as like, we're kind of Bitcoin crazy people. Right. And you should take, <laughs> you should take this, you view this through that lens. Right. But in history, sometimes the people that are crazy enough to uh, think they can change the world are the ones who actually do. So take that into account as well. You know? Yep. Well, in 2013, whenever I was transitioning from the futures market to Bitcoin, everybody in the trading world was making fun of me saying I was crazy. Yeah. So who's laughing now, bitches? <laughs> <laughs> the best. It's the best. All right, guys. Well, we'll leave it off on that. And then, um, yeah, we'll have to do one of these within the next year and see where we're sitting. Beautiful. Sounds awesome. good. Thanks for having All right, us on, Chris. Thanks, guys. We'll good catch up with you later.